Um, I'm so excited to be in this role in welcoming the class of 2024 and transfers to Stanford. During this event, you will have the opportunity to hear from women on faculty in the science, math, and engineering departments at Stanford and be able to hear about the opportunities that the WCC provides for women in STEM. Even though this is the last event that we will be hosting during the official NSO weekend, don't forget about the other two events we will be hosting at the end of week one, which you can find on our website or on our social media. Also be sure to keep an eye out for more details about the WCC intern program, where you will have the opportunity to shadow a staff member, help put on programming and connect with the WCC and broader Stanford community. For more information about the WCC, our program areas, or about ways to get involved and stay connected, please sign up for our WCC announced mailing list and check out our websites. Now I will turn it over to Tessa, the WCC Women in STEM coordinator, who will be moderating the panel. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi everyone, my name is Tessa and I'm currently a senior studying computer science and I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to help introduce new frosh and transfers to the Women's Community Center. The We Are STEM faculty panel is the first of many events we will be holding throughout the year that focus on the issues women and folks of marginalized genders face in the world of STEM. Today you'll be hearing from five very well-respected faculty members who have devoted their time to working and teaching in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics departments at Stanford. All of our panelists today have contributed valuable knowledge and expertise to their respective fields and have a passion for connecting with undergraduates and supporting their curiosity in STEM. So our first panelist, Emma Brunskill, is an assistant professor in the computer science department. Her lab within the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Group is focused on enabling AI algorithms to make good decisions with relatively few samples. Her work is within the subfield reinforcement learning, which aims to create AI systems that learn through experience. Professor Brunskill is passionate about the real world applications of reinforcement learning, including the, in the world of healthcare and education, where data is limited and perfect simulators do not exist. Welcome Professor Brunskill. Happy to be here. Um, our next panelist is Monica Schleier-Smith. Um, she is an associate professor in physics. While pursuing her PhD in physics at MIT, Professor Schleier-Smith improved the precision of atomic clocks to surpass the standard quantum limit. The Schleier-Smith lab at Stanford aims to study multi-particle quantum systems by building them from scratch. Professor Schleier-Smith and her team's work in assembling these highly entangled states of laser-cooled atoms could have important implications for quantum computing and creating some of the most preci precise atomic clocks yet. Welcome, Professor Schleier-Smith. Thanks, good to be here. Um, so our next panelist is Debbie Sineski. Um, Debbie Sineski is an associate professor of aeronautics and astronautics at Stanford. As a researcher, her interests include developing nanomaterials to withstand extremely harsh environments and building high temperature electronics. She leads the Extreme Environment Microsystems Laboratory at Stanford, where her group is studying the synthesis of graphene-based nanomaterials in microgravity environments. Currently, they're gearing up to conduct exper experiments on the International Space Station with the help of astronauts. Welcome, Professor Sineski. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, next, we have Aditi Shashadri. Aditi Shashadri is an assistant professor in the Earth System Science Department. Some of her broad research interests include atmosphere and ocean dynamics and climate variability. Most recently, her team used data from giant balloons to study the motions of gravity waves in our atmosphere, which affect the behavior of the jet stream and the polar, polar vortex. Her work has implications for improving weather prediction, especially as historical patterns have been disrupted by climate change. Um, welcome, Professor Shashadri. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, and finally, we have Lisa Yan. Um, Lisa Yan is an, a lecturer in the computer science department. She did both her master's and PhD at Stanford in electrical engineering, and her PhD thesis work was on computer science education focusing on the challenges of connecting teachers and students in large CS classrooms. As a lecturer, she teaches probability and 
programming courses for sophomore CS students like CS 107 and CS 109. She is nervous and excited about this year where teaching and learning online will play a different role in everyone's lives while we are all away from campus. Welcome for Professor Yan. Hi, excited to be here. So thank you all for being a part of the panel. And um, before we, we begin, we would love for you all to put your Zoom back on speaker view. Okay, so um, I'd like to start our discussion by asking some leading questions for our panelists. At the end, we will open up the discussion for audience Q and A. Um, I'll start in alphabetical order of the panelists to take on our first question, which is what drew you to STEM and how did you know that it was the right path for you? We can start with uh, Professor Brunskill. Um, sure, so uh, I always liked math and science. I also really loved history and English, um, but I think I had um, sort of a long, I, um, had an, I thought of my identity as being sort of a math and scientist very early. Um, and so I think I wasn't quite sure exactly what I would study within that, but um, I knew I wanted to do sort of science and math. And then when I went to college, and I guess just sort of in the couple years before college, I took a physics class and I thought physics was really amazing. It was sort of about the foundations of the universe. Um, and I thought that was really incredible. Um, but then when I was doing, so I was a physics and computer engineering major um, for my bachelor's, but then I also got exposed to computer science during that time period. And I was really drawn to the optimism of the field and the engineering aspects of it. Um, so then I ended up deciding to pursue a PhD in that area. Thanks so much. Um, we can move on to Professor Schleier-Smith. Thanks. So um, I can relate a bit to what Emma said about, you know, having always liked um, math uh, and, and nevertheless had broad interests growing up. Um, and I'll, I'll mention my mother had a background in the humanities and she sort of always impressed upon me that, you know, you could always read literature on the side, um, but you couldn't sort of just do math on the side and, you know, go into <laughs> literature for your career. So, um, so uh, I, I loved math. I had a really fantastic high school chemistry teacher um, and, and that got me into chemistry. And I still remember um, my chemistry teacher would make these um, beautiful analogies in describing, for example, electrons and atoms as being not just sitting at a point, but being sort of a, having this orbital that was some um, smeared out like peanut butter all over space. And he introduced this concept of uncertainty, quantum uncertainty, that I was fascinated by and wanted to learn more about. And I had this general notion that to learn more about it and to learn about it at a fundamental level, I had to um, really delve deep into physics. Um, and so that motivated me starting college to take, I was taking math, I was taking chemistry, I was taking physics, and I wasn't sure which of them I would end up um, um, you know, focusing on most. Um, but at some point I had this sense, I really loved my math classes perhaps more than anything else, but I couldn't imagine my whole job being just to think. Um, and so what kind of drew me more and more into physics was this sense that maybe this is a, a career where you can do something hands-on, but also do some theoretical work and really combine all of those things that I loved. Um, and so, you know, at some point I spent a summer in an experimental physics lab and um, decided to keep going in that direction to, to where today I, I'm an experimental physicist, um, but at the same time I'm in a field where I often get to do more theoretical work and combine it with what we measure in the lab and see if it all agrees. And I love that. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Sineski. Hi, very similar to what uh, Monica and Emma said. As a young student, I loved math and always excelled at math. It was something that came fairly naturally to me. And so I was gravitated towards the STEM fields in, in, in my studies. I ended up choosing mechanical engineering as my major. Uh, recently, I tried to drill it down a little bit and, and figure out what what was it about math that I really enjoyed? And I think it was to me very much the problem solving aspect of math going into a problem. They give you this funky looking equation, right? With symbols and numbers and there's this equal sign and you're trying to figure out how these symbol and numbers relate to each other. And I found that to be very much a problem solving um, or even puzzle solving skill. And it was something I enjoyed. I enjoyed figuring it out and getting the answer right. That was something that I think I exercised a lot in, as a young student in solving math problems. And I see that in other aspects of my life, um, 
also tinkering as a, a young uh, student as well, taking things apart at home. We had cassette players and one time I cassette, some of you may not have had a cassette player, but um, there are things that played music anyway. And, and it was a very mechanical uh, system. And one time my cassette player broke and so instead of you know throwing it away, I thought, let me take it apart and maybe I can fix it. So I opened it up and I got to see the gear system inside. And then I saw the actual gears slipped and I was able to fix it and put it back together and, and see it work. And so that really, I remember that moment, it kind of resonated with me and eventually, yes, throw back to tapes. Yes, new kids on the block. Um, that was my first cassette tape. Yeah, so, so that's how I ended up in the STEM fields. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we can move on to per Professor Shashadri. Yeah, so I, I, I do identify with many of the things that have been said so far, except for the engineering aspect. Um, I grew up uh, with a dad who was a professor of aerospace engineering, and my mom um, is a doctor. She's a real doctor, <laughs> um, which is something I still hear about. And um, I spent a lot of time with my dad, like in the summer holidays. I remember that um, there was this one time when I complained I was bored, and he taught me the Pythagoras theorem. And uh, that's just something that just continued um, when I was very, very, very young. So I really wanted to be an aerospace engineer, just like him, I guess. Um, and I went along that path for quite a bit. And I have bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering. Uh, but uh, I, I, I didn't find in myself this tinkering and taking apart thing that Debbie just described. In fact, that's the kind of thing that I would be really, really bad at. Uh, but, well, to back up a little bit, I did mechanical engineering um, as an undergrad because for some reason, even back then, I wanted to do fluid dynamics. Um, I liked the idea of Navier-Stokes and turbulent flows and the fact that they were um, applicable to all of these varying systems going from, I don't know, galaxies being formed to like these vortices on planets, like I'd seen pictures of, I used to play with the uh, solar system simulator. I don't know if anyone else remembers that, but it was this NASA thing that I grew up sort of playing around with. So hence the mechanical engineering. Also, I guess um, I grew up in India where uh, you can either do engineering or you can do medicine. I mean, if you grow up in a family similar to mine, those are the two sort of professional options, right? So I did engineering. I, I now think physics would have been a better fit for the way that I think. But anyway, so I, I, I got into what I do basically because of my dad. I read a lot of science fiction growing up as well. Um, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov were two of my favorites. Um, so, so that's how I got into it. And how did I know it was going to be a good fit? I thought it was a particularly good question because in the last several months, I've been reading so much about virology and immunology for, you know, obvious reasons. So I do feel that there are other things that I wish I had learned a bit more about, but I do love what I do. I mean, it's just, it's, um, it's a really, really great fit for the way that I think. So I don't know that it is an optimal solution, but it's a local um, optimum anyway for me. So, yeah. Thanks so much, um, Professor Yan. I pressed the wrong button. Okay. Um, so my dad is an electrical engineer. I think uh, similar to a lot of people here, like we, we've had relatives who have exposed us to these types of STEM fields growing up. So I, I kind of always knew that engineering was an option. But I mean, to be honest, I think I've always loved all parts of school. So uh, like in high school, for example, I took two different languages, Italian and Spanish, you know, I was part of like literary magazine and like I love the internet and I wanted to do something with the internet. So I mean, I was thinking when I entered college, I figured, okay, what could I possibly do that could combine all these interests. Um, and so throughout my college and master's and PhD, I really switched around on a lot of things. Um, I thought I wanted to do business, but I didn't really like economics all too much. 
Um, and then I thought I wanted to do something wireless networking, uh, which is actually quite a theoretical field of electrical engineering uh, as it was 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but I still wanted to do something more that could combine a whole bunch of things. And so it took me actually quite a long time to decide, maybe until just three or four years ago after, what, 15 years of schooling or something. Um, but I finally decided on computer science, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I think the biggest value about STEM degrees is that they really like help to put people at the starting line for success. Um, and in particular, I think computer science, especially as it is at Stanford, is incredibly empowering. Um, and it gives you like these tools to kind of research and understand everything, including the internet, including business, including language, all these things I was really interested in. Um, and so I think I've, I finally found my calling, not maybe just in computer science, but in really being able to introduce people to it as a tool, as something useful for them to understand the world around them. Thank you everyone so much for sharing. Um, we can move on to the next question. Um, what kinds of identity related pressures or struggles have you experienced in your career and how have you handled it? Um, and oh, we can go in alphabetical order again, uh, Professor Brunskill. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, uh, I think things are changing over time and um, uh, hopefully this will be something that will happen less and less over time. Um, but I think certainly I and I suspect all the other panelists have experienced times where people assume it's easier for me because I'm a woman. Um, like, you know, it'll be easier to get summer internships or it'll be easier to get a faculty position or things like that. Um, and I think I noticed actually, I think a number of us did our PhDs at MIT and I love MIT, it was a wonderful place. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if you come out of some of these pretty prestigious schools, some people, particularly if they don't know a lot, might assume that you can just walk into any job you want, particularly if you're a female and um, that is not the case. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, that can be frustrating sometimes, I think, um, to have some of those perceptions and but I think on the other hand um, you know I don't have a, a magic bullet for, for dealing with those um, and those are questions of course that I've asked myself about some things but I think on the other hand um, you know I love the science I love what I do and um, I think that a lot of the times if those things come up I sort of just rely on some really amazing mentors and supporters I've had through I've been really lucky to have really throughout um, all of my education and my career um, and people who told me that you know that I deserve to be here um, and I think also I have really wonderful friends for those situations and then kind of just focus on getting back to work you know um, and hoping to make a climate where less people will experience those sort of questions going forward. Thanks so much. Um, Professor Schleier-Smith. Thanks. So um, I think I want to actually start by echoing what um, Emma said about having um, had fantastic mentors throughout my career and, and feeling that I'm in a field where I am overall um, just I, I feel a part of it. I feel supported in every way. So um, um, and, and so I feel very fortunate that I've found that field. Um, now, uh, in terms of, you know, identity related pressures or struggles. Another thing that struck me um, in thinking about this question is that actually, even though obviously as a woman in physics, I'm, you know, part of a group that's very underrepresented in the field, it wasn't something that I even really thought about in college. Um, somehow I just, yeah, I was one of the few women in these classes, but I, I didn't really think about it and it didn't bother me. And, and when I think about why that is, I, I suspect a part of it is just my personality that my sense of identity comes from what my interests are. I, you know, I identify as a physicist, I identify as an athlete and a musician, and those things give me a sense of identity where um, I can find common ground um, with people who might you know, externally sort of look different, right? Um, so that's been important to me. But that said, um, so in terms of um, uh, challenges, I think it was probably only in graduate school that I started um, um, thinking about sort of, you know, what are the challenges of, of being a woman in, in, in this sort of male dominated field of physics. Um, partly, to be honest, because um, I was at MIT and there was in fact a women in physics group which had free dinner every week or every other week. So, <laughs> so it was an excuse to, you know, meet every two weeks with other women in physics. And I would actually hear them before I even thought about it in my own context, I would hear them talk about what some of the struggles were that they were having um, in the research environment. And I started to realize that sort of one common theme had to do with um, communication styles. And in particular, and I don't want to overgeneralize, right, because we're all individuals, but I think there's an overall tendency um, for women to be sort of less assertive in the way that they communicate. 
And particularly in my field of physics, I would say the sort of standard way to have a discussion um, is to assert something and see whether somebody will try to prove you wrong. Um, and so that was something that was um, really something I had to get used to because for me actually often the standard way if I think somebody says something that's wrong, the way I might respond is to ask a question like I, I don't understand why isn't it like this. And then maybe they think I, I, you know, I, I just don't understand, but really I'm actually trying to make a point, right? So for me, it actually was good to sort of hear from other people's experiences and start to realize that there are some differences in communication styles that I have to be consciously aware of, and I have to figure out how to assert myself in a way that I'm actually heard. Um, uh, and so that is something that I think just, just being aware of that, being aware of communication styles and being aware of maybe the need to get out of what's natural to you because the culture in the field or in the environment you're in um, is, is a much more assertive style. Um, and so that's something that over time, you know, for better or worse, it's come very naturally to me to adopt that, that more assertive style of discussion. Um, and, and now sort of in my own research group, I have to make sure that I, I um, make sure that also the less assertive voices are heard. But that's something that I've definitely kind of learned over time. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I feel like it's not talked about too much, but communication styles has definitely been a, a barrier for me. And I know a lot of women, so yeah, I'm glad you're talking about it. Um, so we can move on to Professor Sineski. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so the question is identity related pressures. And I think I have all sorts of identity related um, pressures in many aspects of my life. I'm a woman in engineering. I'm biracial. I'm half African American and Filipino. I'm the first in my family to go to college. So I think throughout most of my education career, I've, I've felt kind of out of place or, or, you know, not that I felt that personally, uh, but, you know, I, I definitely stood out in, in many aspects. And I think that I actually, I think that that has helped me a lot in my career, being comfortable being the only woman in the room of, let's say you're at a conference, it's, it could be very common that I'm the only woman in the room of a, a thousand people and being comfortable with that. But also I'm very proud of that as well. And I think this is something that it, even as a young student being the only female in class, uh, differential equations and you know, acing the exams, that felt really good that I could serve as a role model. And that's something that I, I carry with me uh, even today in my work. And, you know, uh, I echo what Monica said. So these are aspects of my life, you know, being a woman and also my identity uh, in terms of ethnic identity, but also my identity as an engineer. And that's something that you know, I, I separate out. I, I, I totally identify as an engineer and can geek out with anybody at, you know, any age or any institution. And that's just, I have a lot of fun with that. And I, I try to really separate that out, right? And just, you know, there are these voices uh, in your head that might say, you know, come and, you know, people call it imposter syndrome. I think that's very common, but you know, really understanding that, hey, I belong here. I have this talent to share. I'm technical, I'm an engineer. If you have any doubts about that, you can go on my website and look at my CV. You could even pull up my transcripts if you want, you know, like I did that myself. And uh, acknowledging your skills, um, I think that, and so that's how I, I carry um, these, you know, I guess, identity related issues. I try, again, not to categorize it and, and just move forward with my skill set and move forward with problem solving as much as I can, but also serve as a role model. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Professor Shashadri? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think everything I was going to say has kind of been said already, maybe in slightly different ways. But um, so when I did my undergrad, uh, I chose to do mechanical engineering in this private college in Bangalore, which is this kind of high tech city in the south of India, but even in a pretty progressive 
um, environment. I was the only woman in my undergraduate class of mechanical engineers. Um, and for some reason at that point, I wasn't even thinking about it. Like it was just, it's, it just turned out that way or whatever. And, and, and we did mechanical engineering. Like we, I know how to use a lathe. I know how to weld, like things like that. Um, so I actually became aware of these issues more when I was in graduate school at MIT, uh, which was fantastic training for learning to be assertive to the extent that now um, I have, I was very recently accused of being uh, aggressive in a meeting, right? And I feel like that wouldn't have happened if I were a guy, it would have just been entirely normal. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I don't think that identity issues have impacted me to the extent that I remember any one incident in any great detail. Um, and I do very much enjoy my work. Um, so I think so that's the sort of thing that I focus on um, in terms of dealing with the identity issues. I guess it's true that I don't feel completely at home in situations uh, such as Emma and Monica and Debbie all mentioned. I've, I've definitely been the only woman in, in the room, like when I'm giving a department seminar somewhere or something. Like I've been in departments where they didn't even have a single graduate student who was a woman in the room, which is which is kind of absurd, but that's what it is. And uh, but it for some reason I've just learned to deal with it. Um, I guess it's helped that I've had a number of male mentors and colleagues who um, who have been supportive and um, and collaborators as well. So when I travel now to visit people and give seminars and go to conferences it's it, they don't make me feel different so uh so i guess i don't really have a good answer to your question of how to deal with the identity issues i think we're all just figuring it out well thank you um professor yan uh it's hard going last, but um, <laughs> I, I want to talk about a different dimension of identity. Um, and that one is the fact that the bachelor's degree is four years. Um, and so when you enter uh, as a freshman, you immediately see people who are three years, two years, one year along in your studies path. And that that is very difficult because I mean, you, you might be thinking, how, how can I possibly accomplish all of these things? Right. And like, and then you're taking classes with these sophomores and juniors and seniors. And that also makes it very difficult because, I mean, you just, you can't even envision yourself getting to this path. Um, so I think it's always important to like, just remember where you were four years ago, or even remember if you're a transfer student, remember where you were one year ago or two years ago, and just how much you've grown since then. So I think something that has really helped me um, get over that imposter syndrome when looking at um, people who are more experienced than me. Uh, something that's been very useful for me is just making like really establishing a community of people that are of my experience level or of my age um, or even of my interests. And, and I think Monica and Emma have talked about this a little bit. It's just like if you have an interest outside of STEM, it's always nice to be able to talk to them and realize that, oh yeah, you know, there's like you know, like I chose a very challenging path and that's, that's okay. And that's really cool because, you know, you get respect from a lot of other people who uh, perhaps are not in the same challenging path you are and you are kind of like a window, a connection to this world of STEM. And so that is a responsibility is, I don't know, to me, it's, it's a very productive one because I think uh, trying to always be a role model all the time is very uh, mm -hmm. burdening especially if you've never been a role model before, but being able to talk and have these conversations with uh, people you feel comfortable with and being able to educate them on what you do is, is really wonderful, so. Thanks so much, yeah, at Stanford, imposter syndrome is really real and I, I'm glad you talked about, you know, like connecting with friends about it. That's been my greatest support system and knowing people also go through it too. Um, so our next question is, um, how can women act as allies to other folks whose identities are underrepresented in STEM? And can you tell us about a time you witnessed or demonstrated effective allyship in academia? Um, and we can mix it up this time and start with Professor Yan. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, so uh, this is a hard question. I think, um, to be honest, I'm still really grappling with it because, I mean, 
yes, I am a woman in STEM, but I also am not a first generation student and I am not from an underrepresented minority in CS as it is at Stanford. There's, there's plenty of Asian women who study and, and are very successful in this field. Um, so I think over the past few years, I think um, I've really come to terms with the fact that like I do have privilege um, and that it's very hard for me to make these types of conversations about um, understanding what other people who again are not from the same community as me, what they may be going through and how I can help them. So I think something that has really stood out to me, especially um, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement this year um, and Stanford's, the, specifically the Stanford CS department's response uh, to this is that everyone, at least in computer science, is very like looking to understand. Um, but we also recognize that, uh, you know, it's not the responsibility of those underrepresented groups to help us understand. So I think that's something that I'm constantly grappling with and I'm very thankful to, um, to my colleagues and also to students like you who are able to inform, uh, but also show me that I need to do more by myself. So it's something I'm still working on. Thanks, um, Professor Shashadri. So the best thing I could come up with with what can we do is have an open door, I think. Um, and that could be various things. It's just um, in terms of dealing with students, um, I, I, I think the best I can do really is to help in whatever way I can by listening. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think, frankly, I've done very much along these lines so far. I mean, I've only been a professor for two-ish years now. Uh, so I'm still figuring that question out. Uh, for the second part of your question, though, um, the allyship, I, I, I do think I have a very good example of that in my own life, which is uh, that when I was negotiating for my startup at Stanford, um, it seems like within the school, a lot of people don't really tell you what they got or um, what points it is that you should, you should be uh, negotiating for when you uh, are trying to get a tenure track position or once you've got one, like what should you have to succeed, right? And uh, um, so there, there was a, um, well, she happens to be female, I, but um, there was someone in my department who had been around for a few more years than I had, who was willing to send me like every detail. Like she sent me like the, the numbers down to the last dollar, each of the little points that she had negotiated, you know. So uh, I think that was, a, that was a great demonstration of allyship. Uh, and, and, and it's a pretty uh, concrete example of a way in which I have benefited tremendously because um, this didn't appear to be something that was common, at least in my school. And then of course, there's always things like when you're in a meeting and there happens to be somebody who, I mean, at Stanford, everyone has opinions, right? It's just a question of getting them to voice them. So if there's someone in the meeting who doesn't seem to be able to get a word in edgewise, simply because they're not being called upon or whatever, uh, one thing that I do like to do is to call upon the quieter students in a way that doesn't make them feel like they're being singled out, but um, attempt to give them a voice uh, to speak up in meetings and group meetings and classes, you know, whatever. Uh, but I'm also looking forward to hearing from more experienced people on this. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, we can hear from Professor Sineski next. Yeah, uh, I, I like this question a lot because I think it's something that I have recently practiced uh, in my career. In the last four years in terms of really identifying mentors and allies and sponsors based on the goals that I'm trying to achieve. Um, and it's really irrespective of gender. I have amazing male mentors and allies and sponsors. And I think recognizing that and uh, recognizing the people that want to support you. Uh, my department's amazing, amazing uh, supportive environment. And really it's, I think it's, you know, and maybe it's where I am in my career. A lot of it is what knowing what I need for this, for my goals. And so, you know, looking at 
my career aspirations or things that I want to develop and work on, uh, being a little bit more aggressive and targeting people that you want to connect with, not being afraid to reach out, uh, sending an email to somebody that you really admire. And I had to, this was not comfortable for me because I'm a very self-reliant person. I just, that's just how I am, the way I grew up. I did everything myself. And then I realized in this job, you know, running your own research lab, you need to work with other people in terms of collaborating on research, but also building a community. And I think it's important when you, you know, to identify people that can help you advance in being a part of a community. And so I encourage folks to maybe, um, you know, reflect on yourself, reflect on what you need and what you have at your disposal. Stanford's an amazing place. People who love to be mentors, you know, uh, people go into academia because they love to mentor and nurture young people with bright ideas and energy. And so don't be afraid to reach out to, you know, your, your professors or people outside of Stanford. Chances are they're going to respond to you if you really um, convey that there's a genuine and authentic interest in connecting with that person. So I kind of flip this on myself as how can I develop the right partnerships and allyships myself um, and so this is something I've, I've practiced more recently and I, I think it has benefited me a lot. Well, thank you so much. Um, Professor Schleier-Smith. Yeah, so I think um, this sort of answer to, you know, ways in which ways to exercise allyship might depend, might depend a little bit on sort of, you know, what stage of a career you're at. Um, but I think that one thing that everybody can do in whatever environment you're in, be it, you know, research or a classroom, is just working to establish a culture that's um, kind of inclusive for everybody and where um, everybody's ideas are heard and credited. And so this, this builds a little bit on something Aditi said earlier about um, um, if you're noticing that somebody isn't getting a chance to get a word in, right, you can help that happen. Um, but even sometimes I've, I've seen situations where maybe somebody actually did get a word in and later what they said was attributed to somebody else, right? I, <laughs> I see some uh, nods there, right? So you can be an ally in sort of correcting that or, or saying, um, well, so-and-so had this great idea and building on that, I was, right? So, so that's something you, you can also do is amplify um, voices that are, that are not being heard. Um, but I think another thing in this, in this sort of, um, along these lines of establishing an inclusive um, uh, uh, community, this is something that all of you can do, you know, now already in your, you know, first year classes. I think one of the most important things often in um, kind of science and math and engineering classes is having a good peer group um, to, you know, work with on problem sets to study with and so forth. Um, and I'll have to say, to be honest, actually in college, um, for the first couple of years, I mostly did my problem sets alone, not because I didn't feel included, but that was just sort of my default mode of operation. And it was around my junior year that I so somehow found this group of people who I loved doing physics problem sets with. And then by senior year, I was choosing classes based on who else would be in the class <laughs> um, because I knew that that would make it more fun. So, but I think, so why did I mention that? One thing that you can certainly do um, is think about um, being in inclusive in the way that you form those groups, right? Or just openly saying, we're gonna meet at this time and work on the problem set and, and making sure that everybody's aware of that and that there's not an in-group and an out-group, right? And so I think those are things that we can do to really, um, uh, to help. So. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Professor Brunskill? Um, I guess I'll just build a little bit on what Monica was saying. And I, I guess before saying that, I would say to echo what Lisa was saying, I think that um, I have an enormous amount of privilege. I'm, you know, a white woman in computer science, which means I'm relatively less um, uh, represented than white males. But, you know, I think um, I'm not a first generation college student. My parents are college educated and I came in with, you know, an enormous amount more privilege than many. And so I think I'm still early in my education. And um, I think uh, I've had a lot of really amazing colleagues um, uh, who have been sort of, you know, demonstrating through their own actions, different ways to form allyship. Um, I think in terms of what Monica was just saying, I think one thing that I think um, in the work, like in, in sort of how 
the research group and uh, community I try to cultivate and in terms of sort of my own experience in undergrad and grad is sort of separating out the difference between, um, and this took me a while to, to, to recognize this, the difference between having prior background and potential. And so I came into computer science, um, I think I came in, I did my first class at the end of my sophomore year or something like that, which, you know, compared to many of my peers was incredibly late. Some people have been programming since they were 10. And so people would come in and have spent like two hours on an assignment that took me literally 20. Like, <laughs> I'm not exactly, it was like a 10x difference, right? And so I think, um, and so why did I continue? Well, I loved it. And also like I could do, the class was set up to allow people without background to succeed. And so I think as you think about sort of forming those those peer groups like it's not the person that necessarily you know was the um like world physics olympiad winner that needs to be in your group i mean they're great people and stanford and mit and these other places literally have people who have won those sort of competitions which is extraordinary um but there are also an enormous number of people coming in who just hadn't you know they didn't have ap physics at their high school and so they couldn't have possibly you know done those sort of things um and so i think i try to think about that when i'm on you know, grad school um, admissions or in, looking at internships or, or thinking about that for people taking my classes of, you know, how do we make sure that everybody uh, has an opportunity to thrive, um, regardless of the opportunities that they had before. Um, and so instead of just people that maybe have already been able to have the chance to demonstrate those prior expertise, um, you know, a lot of people um, have the potential to do incredibly well in STEM. Um, and I think forming sort of inclusive groups so that everyone can have that potential and sort of realize um, how incredibly fun it can be, um, I think it's, it's really important. Thank you so much. Um, so for the sake of time, we'll um, just ask one more question of the panelists so we can um, give the audience some time to ask questions of them. Um, so our last question for all of you is what advice would you give to your younger self and more specific to our audience, what advice would you give to a young woman aspiring to specialize in STEM? Um, you can start with Professor Yan. Okay. Uh, probably the biggest piece of advice I would say is um, don't be afraid to do something different and I mean I mean I mean I mean that in many ways I mean I think in academia we really value uniqueness of ideas and these types of things um, but I think coming out of high school or uh, coming from other colleges oftentimes you're kind of just stuck in this one path and then you take everything in that path and then you see everyone else in that path uh, and even if you don't want to do it there's no other path <laughs> for you um, but the the great thing about uh, college and particularly the great thing about Stanford is that there are so many great paths out there um, and oftentimes it's often very important to just kind of consider like the cost benefit kind of you know of taking classes that you don't particularly like and then trying to get to you know some ultimatum of something that your uh, senior friend said was super cool uh, versus just you know trying out a whole bunch of things and then realizing what you what you could probably never take for the rest of your life or what you would you know not mind taking um, and like, I mean, the story for me is that I actually entered a uh, university as an environmental engineer because I was part of Eco Club, some like, you know, very small organization in my high school. And I thought that was what I wanted to do. Uh, and then I realized that the requirement had chemistry and I decided <laughs> to try computer science instead because I think it was something where I, like, I just kind of realized that I think if I were to continue to have to take these classes that I did not like to take, then I think that would really inhibit my, uh, excitement about the field and so being in computer science i realized that there was a lot more excitement and i was like you know i was happy with the classes i was taking but there was also a lot more potential for those types of things so again just don't be afraid to switch ships again four years is a really long time and i think in those first three or four quarters you're still trying to figure out what uh what you are good at but also what you do not like to do <laughs> yeah thanks so much i feel like especially during COVID, it's, it's definitely been, I've had to learn a lesson in switching paths and, you know, the importance of, you know, not, your plan doesn't always have to work out. But, um, we can move on to uh, Professor Shashadri. Um, all right, so I'll try to be short since we're um, almost out of time. Um, I guess two things. One is uh, find the thing that resonates for you and become really, really good at it because that's something that's yours and no one can take away. 
And the other thing I'd say is just learn to be very, very persistent and just persevere with whatever it is that you want to accomplish. Um, as a very minor example of this, uh, the project that you introduced me with was using data from these giant balloons. Mm -hmm. um, and they were actually put up into the atmosphere by Loon, which was which came out of Alphabet, uh, part of Google. Um, so it took me two years to get my hands on that data. Uh, I, I showed up at Stanford and kept asking for it and uh, emailed everyone I knew and uh, met with the dean and met with, I, I, I forget the number of people that I had to meet with and the number of times that I was said no to. Uh, so it's, it's, it's what, I mean, if you send an email and you don't hear back in a week, just send the email again, it's fine. Um, so to, don't be afraid to ask for help and stick with whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish because people will try and knock you down and circumstances will try and knock you down. But um, I think perseverance is really, really key to um, being a woman in STEM, I guess, was your question. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much, um, Professor Sineski. Yeah, I, I think that yeah, a lot of, I echo a lot of things that were mentioned, you know, and I like the, the point about really understanding and taking a pulse at the various stages in your career. Um, your career will have U-turns. This is just, you know, likely going to happen. You might end up in a career that is totally different from what you originally planned. I, this has happened to me multiple times. I didn't, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to graduate school. I wasn't sure if I wanted to get a PhD. I didn't want to be a professor. Uh, you know, these are things that were not on my radar at certain points in my career, but I tried different things and then I learned and I, you know, listen to yourself. If you're, you choose your, your major, you guys are entering Stanford, you have some time to choose a major, what feels good to you? What classes do you really like and enjoy and pursue that and I wouldn't worry about, is this the right field? Because you're going to shift and change and have this opportunity and this tenacity and perseverance. If there's something, you know, five years and years from now that you want to pursue, you're going to have that perseverance to line up the right things to move and shift your career in that direction. So I think be very flexible, be open, take a pulse to what excites you right now everything is changing, technology is changing if you end up going in into the STEM fields. Um, and also I think be open to creating uh, multidisciplinary fields. You might like language, you might like writing. How can you blend writing and STEM, technical writing, things like that. So I think being open to what you're really passionate about and not being afraid to just take that step, stay with it for a while, and you can make adjustments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Professor Schleier-Smith. So you'll hear some more echoes of things that have been said before, but I think that's OK. Um, one, one bullet point I had on my list was don't be shy and don't be afraid to ask for questions and ask for help and help. And I think Aditi already said this quite well. Um, but um, I, just to give a couple of examples of this, um, so sort of thinking back to my younger self, I remember spending um, doing a summer internship in a research group in Germany. Um, it was an experimental physics group. I was doing a little computational project and I was too shy to ever ask for a tour of the labs, which had this like, these, like really cool equipment, but I was too shy to ask for a tour. And it wasn't until I went back actually as a postdoc and visited again and gave a talk there that I actually finally saw these labs. And <laughs> just how did I spend three months there and not ask to look in the lab, right? So, um, um, and I really was just too shy. Um, but I think the time that when I actually started to learn this, to ask for help, I really probably only started to learn it as a faculty member because you come and basically nobody tells you what to do. Nobody tells you how you start a research lab or even how you teach. Nobody tells anybody, right? So the only way is to go knock on people's doors and ask. And it turns out that that's actually a great way to get to know people. Um, and almost everybody loves to give help when they're asked. And you know what? If they don't, then the worst thing that happens is you asked and you didn't get an answer, right? That's the worst thing that can happen. So um, yeah, OK, so don't be shy. And then the sort of second set of points I wanted to make is I think you know we all know that we are sort of looking for 
um, a field um, or a career where we're passionate about um, you know, the impact of what we're going to do, sort of, you know, if it's science, we're passionate about somehow the research topic. Um, but I think it's also super important to enjoy, you know, whatever the big picture goals are that you're fa ex excited by, to also enjoy the day to day. Um, and, and that takes some experimentation, trying things out and seeing where do you also like what the day to day work is. Um, um, so again, if you're interested in, in science, t take the opportunity to try out different labs and different, you know, summers um, of college. Um, and it's not even just what are you doing day to day, but also I think so important and perhaps under underestimated is just who are you doing it with, right? And so finding um, just mentors who you um, can relate to, who, who you somehow have the right chemistry with, right? Finding good mentors, finding great peers who you're just having fun working with every day. That is so important because if you're having fun, whatever you're doing, you're gonna do it well and be successful. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Professor Bunskill. Yeah, I think that um, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said. Just to echo on uh, that last point too, I remember when I was picking, I was doing a master's at Oxford um, and I was picking rotation projects. And I remember someone said, well, you can pick based on the project or you can pick based on the people. Um, and of course that's a slight oversimplification. You could imagine both, but uh, but I picked based on the people. Um, I picked, I also was somewhat shy at various points in my career, a little bit less now, but, um, and, and I wanted to work with people that I felt like, like I knew it was going to be critical to be able to ask what I thought were dumb questions in order to learn and be able to do good science. And so I picked people that I thought I would be comfortable enough to ask those sort of questions. Um, and, you know, and, and also I like the general topics. And I found generally, um, you know, picking based on people, I, I'm, I'm pretty curious about a lot of things. Um, and so I think for me, when there's been sort of coming down to between two people, that's sometimes a really um, useful heuristic to have. Um, but that was actually separate than the, the four things that I was going to mention, which is um, the first was, I think being bold is often um, underappreciated during K through 12 and incredibly appreciated through the rest of your life. Um, and I think um, particularly sometimes as women, we're encouraged not to be bold or we're rewarded for not being bold and kind of, you know, writing neatly and doing homework on time and all that stuff, um, you know, in K through 12. And then I think as one goes into college and later, um, the ability to be bold and, um, and to trust yourself as you're making your own decisions is incredibly important. And I think it's something uh, that I think, you know, starting in, in college, you know, really trusting what, what you want to do, be willing to argue for it, and then also um, you know, being able to sort of define what the goals are that you want. So I think in echoing for what some people were saying, um, for me in grad school, I thought I was either going to want to do research and like maybe a professor or join a nonprofit. And there was almost nobody um, in computer science at MIT that was thinking about joining a nonprofit. Um, but I think, you know, everyone has different uh, you know, objective functions, everyone has different goals and, um, and different portfolios of things that they want to accomplish in life. And I think as you're, and those can of course change over time, but I think at, when you're, you know what are the things that you want and that um, are important to you, it can be incredibly helpful in terms of making decisions across all the amazing opportunities you're gonna have access to. Um, and then the final thing I'll just say is, I think it's often really helpful to play the long game. Um, again, I think you know all of you guys coming in will have amazing talents, um, and it can often be really tempting just to kind of do the things that one gets lots of praise for or one's already good at. You know, like um, I was getting really high scores on history exams, and really, you know, there are lots of things that were sort of um, particularly easy at different time points. But I also knew that I, you know, there were some things that were going to be more challenging for me for a while, but would allow me to do the type of work that I wanted to do. And, you know, that might be doing additional math classes that I hadn't done in, as an undergrad or things like that. Um, and I think, you know, thinking of the long game in terms of your career, um, I think is really important. You don't have to pick the things that um, you're good at already. You know, the college is a time for growth and for learning. And so sort of focusing on where you want to be in the next five years or even longer um, can be really helpful. Thanks so much for um, sharing your advice and um, we can conclude the moderation, moderator portion of the panel. Um, we'll be moving into Q&A. Uh, we probably have time for about two questions. Um, so for any students who may have questions and for all, for all of the panelists or just a specific one, please use the chat during this time. Um, and I will try to answer 
um, your questions for you. We obviously won't get to all of them. Um, and then for the panelists, um, you know, maybe just uh, one or two answers to each question so for the sake of time. Thank you. Okay, this is a good question. Um, what is the best way for students to reach out to professors in order to get involved in research or other opportunities? I think office hours are great. Just to throw something out there, office hours, if you're taking a class, um, that's a great way to, you know, you can ask the TAs, you can ask the professor. And also most departments, I think, have summer internship opportunities. I know computer science does. It's called Curis. Um, and so I think you just have to apply by maybe early January. Lisa might be able to correct me, early January or late January. Um, and those also are really great ways because often people just advertise lots of research opportunities on there. I think psychology does this too. And so then you already know that they have an opportunity because they've advertised it. Um, so both of those things. I guess I can maybe add a comment. Um, so, uh, so I typically take, you know, two to three undergraduates in my research group in any given summer and um, Generally, the way that they find me is sending me an email. Now, we're not always great at responding to email. Um, so um, I think someone said earlier, you know, try again if you don't get a response the first time. Um, but yeah, sending an email, giving some idea of, you know, who you are and wh why you're interested, right, um, is a great way um, to get started with a summer research opportunity. And um, doing that early can be helpful because sometimes these, you know, spots do fill up. Um, and there, I'll just also add that there are research opportunities at Stanford, but also often opportunities to apply um, to summer internships at other universities as well. Thanks so much. Um, and also, you can check in the chat, a couple, couple professors have um, listed some options for research there. Um, and for, I can just conclude with one last question, um, which is, um, what is the best way, or sorry, do you have any advice on practicing growth mindsets in STEM fields? Yeah, I think this is a great question and I, I encourage everyone to practice getting out of your comfort zone. What are the things that keep you up at night? What are things that make you scared? And maybe try to do that. Is it is it scary to go to office hours? Uh, maybe that professor is a little intimidating. So then do it, go to office hours, and then you'll find that, oh, okay, it wasn't so bad. Most likely you'll find that it wasn't so bad. And so I think that's how you grow, is, is going to places that are not so comfortable. Is public speaking comfortable? Maybe it's not in the beginning, and then eventually it becomes second nature. So I, I think practice things that might make, feel a little funny at first, and then you'll become comfortable with it. Thank you so much. And it is um, seven, so I want to be mindful of people's time. And thank you for everyone who asked questions. And thanks so much for our panelists for joining us today. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone has a good start to the year. Thanks so much. Thank you for organizing this. Yes, thanks for organizing this. <laughs> and good luck to everybody. We're really happy you're here. I know it's a really unusual start of the year, but we're really, really excited you're here. So good luck. Bye, everyone.